I'm Colin Poon from NYU, and um, thank you for having me at this session this morning. I'll try to keep somewhat to time, and we'll try and have a break without going over too late. Um, it's been great to be here. I've seen a bunch of old friends and have met quite a few new ones and look forward to meeting some more new faces before the end of the conference. Um, I'm going to talk about mitochondria and Barth syndrome. And mitochondria, of course, is a word that will come up repeatedly at a conference such as this. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to emphasize the point that they're not just the powerhouses of the cell, which is what everybody learns in basic uh, high school biology. Uh, so we're going to go over the basic biology of mitochondria. We're going to discuss how mitochondria are involved in a lot of different cellular processes, not just creation of ATP and energy, uh, and including in Barth syndrome. And how, importantly, how the research that is being discussed at this conference and published in papers and at other conferences is leading us to possible therapies uh, by targeting the mitochondria. So um, Wikipedia, this is Wikipedia, this is Encyclopedia Britannica. So mitochondria are, are organelles. They are small little subcompartments within the cell. Uh, you know, they're in addition to the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, things all the Golgi apparatus. And this is a typical diagram of a mitochondrion um, and a typical discussion, a typical definition actually online that you'll find is that they are the powerhouse of the cell. They create a lot of energy by utilizing especially fatty acids. Um, mitochondria, there's a whole category of mitochondrial diseases. If you search on the internet, you will find, for example, the North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium, Barth syndrome, is among these. But it's really, this is a very heterogeneous category. You know, when you go online and you, 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 you um, look up some forums, you'll, you'll hear people talk about mito and things like that. But I think a lot of these diseases, and Barth in particular, are very distinctive. There's, um, and so uh, calling it just a mitochondrial disease, I think, is just sort of a little bit too vague. Um, we know that it is, however, a mitochondrial disease. It's X-linked. Uh, the mutations are in the tafazin gene. This was the original paper uh, by Peter Barth and his colleagues. And it really, it comes down to a disorder of this phospholipid in the mitochondrial membrane called cardiolipin. There's a lot of research uh, that will gloss over on cardiolipin um, being presented at this um, conference. So this is Carl Benda. We have to remember the name Benda at the end of the talk. Uh, he actually was the first to describe mitochondria uh, under the microscope in the late 1800s. And then um, uh, by the early 1900s, somebody had figured out that, that it does cellular respiration. This is taking oxygen and using it to convert uh, chemicals into energy. And then in uh, the mid-1950s, really this guy called it the powerhouse of the cell. And in the early 1960s, I don't have the slide, uh, was the first mitochondrial disease uh, described by a Dr. Luft. Um, it is maternally inherited, which you all know. Uh, a very recent paper just came out in the journal Science that suggests that the mitochondrial DNA that, um, oh, sorry, the, the, there's DNA in the mitochondria, which I forgot to, to show and is on a subsequent slide. And that DNA is inherited from the mother. And a very recent paper suggested that it's actually degraded in the father's sperm, even starting before it, um, the fertilization of the egg. If it, isn't degraded, then the embryo doesn't do very well. You can't have both the paternal and the maternal uh, mitochondrial DNA. This is an electron micro, uh, micrograph of a mitochondrion. It's, it's a, an interesting looking structure. It's got um, some phospholipid membranes. It's got these invaginations called cristae. It's got a matrix in the middle of it where a lot of stuff happens. The respiratory chain is on the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is where um, ATP ultimately is created. And it actually is connected, I'll show on subsequent slides, it's not just floating there in isolation spewing ATP out into the cell. It's connected to other things within the cell. It's actually quite a complex organelle. And it changes depending on its, the cell's need. So it's different in the heart, it's different in the liver, it's different in the brain, it's different in different organs, depending on the energy needs and other needs of that part of the body. However, the main function of mitochondria is to generate ATP. ATP is your energy producing molecule uh, in the cell. And it does it through a number of different uh, complexes uh, within the inner mitochondrial membrane. And these proteins are generated both by 
the mitochondrial that are encoded by the mitochondrial DNA, which is very, a very small structure, as well as your nuclear DNA. And so you can have mutations both in mitochondrial DNA or in nuclear DNA. And for Barth syndrome, it's in the nuclear uh, DNA. It's on your X chromosome uh, that will lead to problems here. You eat food, the sugar and fat will be ultimately converted, especially with, um, in concert with oxygen, uh, to energy. So this is a uh, mitochondrial DNA. It's only got 37 genes on it. It's quite small, but it's very, very important. Uh, many of these genes will encode for one of the complexes, and this is just a schematic of, of a mitochondrion again. You can eat sugars, you can eat fats. It will ultimately convert to ATP and energy. But it does a whole lot more. It's not just that. And the, this complicated slide, all I'm trying to show is that through various proteins, channels, tunnels, connections, it is connected to other organelles within the cell. And it is a very important, it has a very important role in intracellular signaling, as it turns out. And it can actually tell, for example, the cell nucleus, hey, I need something more of something else. Uh, it can do that. That's a relatively new thing, by the way. Um, most of the mitochondrial diseases are mutations in nuclear encoded mutations. Uh, it's, a, again, a very complex uh, organelle with all sorts of uh, proteins and enzymes within it. And most of those proteins and enzymes are encoded by genes that are in the nucleus, not in that mitochondrial DNA. This was a recent review in the New England Journal of Medicine. As I looked through this list, I was appalled to see that tefazin is not on that list. But, oh well. All right. Now, as it turns out, so again, we're talking about energy, we're talking about respiratory chain complexes, but as it turns out, mitochondria and calcium signal are even important in embryonic development. I think this is important. We're, we're going to come to this point when we talk about this non-compaction cardiomyopathy. This is not just an energy thing. There's plenty of energy here. There's plenty of ATP. It's something else. It's signaling. It's the molecules going in and out and telling the nucleus what, what to code for and then uh, bringing it back out to the cell. Reactive oxygen species. We think that ROS is bad very often. Oxidative stress is one of the terms that we use. This is a, an active area of research. But as it turns out, some ROS is good. Too much ROS is bad, but some ROS is good. And um, my friend George Porter at the University of Rochester some years ago published a seminal paper that showed that if you mess around with ROS levels in an embryo, you're going to change the rate of development of the heart cell in the embryo. So you got to get it right. You can't have too much. You can't have too little. Um, the models of Barr syndrome, we've talked about at this conference a lot over in the research sessions. There's yeast, there's cultured cells, there's these iPSC-derived cells uh, that, that Bill Poo has uh, really um, done a lot of good work on. Even something as lowly as the fly has yielded us a lot of information, zebrafish. And much of the work that I've done is on mouse in this uh, inducible defazin knockdown model that the Barr syndrome foundation commissioned to have taconic artemis made. Make. And so I'm going to run through very quickly some of the, the research that's been done over the years. The first two papers that, that, that came out uh, came out of, uh, this is the group from Cincinnati with other collaborators. This is the group from Gainesville, Florida, Barry Byrne and, and his lab. And they took this mouse and they basically showed if you induce the tefazin knockdown, you will get the cardiomyopathy. It's a little bit later. It's quite mild. But all the other features are there. The cardiolipin problem, the mitochondrial problem. Um, all the other features are there. And then shortly thereafter, we, with slightly different experimental techniques, showed that you can actually create non-compaction in this mouse, but it's all lethal. It's lethal before birth. But that, although it was a little bit different from these results, because all these mice survived into adulthood, that sort of spoke to some of the work that Colin Stewart at the University of Bristol in the UK was was showing that there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of fetal loss as well from the fetal cardiomyopathy. Um, this is Bill Poo's work up at Boston, and he's he's done this thing where you're taking cells from from the boys and being able to de-differentiate them into stem cells and re-differentiate them into heart cells, and then studying these heart cells and showing they don't work as well, their mitochondria don't work as well, they don't contract as well, and guess what? They have more ROS, and if you treat the ROS, maybe that will help them. 
Uh, this is a relatively new paper showing metabolic pathways. The only point of this is that if you disturb tofazin, and if you disturb cardiolipin, there's all sorts of stuff downstream that's affected, all sorts of metabolic abnormalities. We know this, though, right? We know this from some of the studies that folks like Richard Kelly uh, have been doing uh, all these years on, on the Barth boys. Um, the lipids are all changed within the mitochondria. You can even exercise these mice and show that there are uh, additional mitochondrial abnormalities. And then recently, um, our lab uh, showed that the cardiolipin, which is the key lipid within mitochondria that, that's affected, uh, it, it has a relatively long half-life. It sticks around for a while, unless you have Barth syndrome. Barth syndrome seems to increase the turnover rate, um, and, uh, and, and you get this abnormal cardiolipin. So really, the, the research, and a lot of this has been done within just the last five years or so, especially since we've had this mouse, but a lot of this has also been done in yeast and flies and all sorts of other model organisms. But what we found is we've, we've had new insights on tofazin and especially cardiolipin. We have new insights on this respiratory chain, on how ATP is made, and how the proteins of that chain stay coupled together or kind of fall apart uh, when you don't have good cardiolipin. We have new information on reactive oxygen species and some hints that antioxidant therapy directed at mitochondria may actually work, may actually help. We have new information on calcium and signaling and the roles that those may play in development of something like non-compaction cardiomyopathy, for example. And although we can apply this, of course, to something like Barth syndrome, which is a primary mitochondrial disease, as it turns out, a lot of other heart disease in adults may also involve cardiolipin. Uh, there's a researcher here from Virginia Commonwealth University, Ed Lesnevsky, that I've been talking to, and he studies the aging heart and the role of abnormal cardiolipin. So he wants to use, he's been using the Barth mouse and the concepts that we've been learning about Barth syndrome, even in the aging heart in patients without Barth syndrome. So secondary effects on mitochondria. So I took these concepts from Matt's talk at the session the other day about therapeutic ideas um, in Barth syndrome. So all this research is leading us to, well, you know, can we use repurposed drugs such as bezofibrate? My colleague Min Dong Ren and I uh, presented um, uh, some data as well as Azakucha from, from uh, Cincinnati on possibly some beneficial effects of bezofibrate. Exercise therapy we've heard about, especially from Todd Cade. Nutritional therapy from the Hopkins group. Enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, from Michael Chin at the University of Washington, gene therapy from Barry Burns' group, uh, lipid replacement, Ross Scavengers, a number of groups are working on, and then this new drug. Um, I'm not even try, I'm gonna try and pronounce that, but Bendavia, right? The original guy who described mitochondria is, is Benda. So this is Bendavia, and they had a poster yesterday about um, short-term treatment and improvement in the six minute walk test. This is what it's about. <coughs> It's about trying to learn about mitochondria so that we can figure out what's wrong with them and then begin to figure out how to target the therapy specifically to mitochondria. The therapies that we have right now are general therapies for heart failure, general therapies for heart dysfunction, and not targeted specifically to the Barth cardiomyopathy. But we need to learn those, those things in order to target this. So this is, these are my collaborators. It's really been a fun ride. I look forward to doing this um, for many, many years. I'm a relative newcomer to mitochondria research, but I am now a believer. <laughs> and I want to make sure that all of you are believers as well. OK, thank you very much. It's 10.15, I know, we're over the break. But any questions I can answer? I have the mic here. Any questions for Colin? And I don't think we got a chance to ask Barry if, he had any, if anybody had any questions for Dr. Byrne, which I had a question. <laughs> so I can start that out, I think. Colin, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so Barry, I, I, we need to mic you. I'll pass you over the mic.
One of the questions I wanted to ask you was, could you tell us a little bit about new drugs that are coming in for treating heart failure? Um, particularly, you know, we've been hearing about Entresto, and I just wondered if you had any information about that for us. I don't know. Do you have any experience in in any of the birth patients? Uh, any of you? Not, not with Entresto. I mean, there's going to be a people organizing a pediatric heart failure study around it. People are organizing a pediatric heart failure study around Entresto. It's just getting going, but it. Uh, I don't. Uh, we may be a center. I don't think that Barth's would be an exclusionary criterion. I'm just trying to remember. We've looked at the protocol, um, but it's going to be a while before that that gets up and running. Okay, and then I take it it would start with adult patients anyway. No, no this is a pediatric. So this, this is a pediatric be. study. So Entresto combines two. Um, sort of like a modification. So the standard heart failure therapy is either an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, that concept of afterload reduction that Dr. Byrne talked about. Often, uh, and Entresto uh, combines another drug, um, I think it's called Sucubitril, which mm, now I forget the mechanism, but it basically in combination in adults has been shown to be more effective than standard therapy with, with afterload reduction in uh, preventing uh, heart failure to compensation and mortality. So it's an exciting drug. Whether it'll have all the same carryover to pediatrics, I think, is really important to test because just as Dr. Byrne said, the beta blocker um, trial in, you know, which beta blockers are well shown in adults to uh, be beneficial, but in the pediatric trial for a number of reasons, it wasn't shown that, that wasn't shown to be the case. It may not, it may be beneficial, it just wasn't shown to be the case. we're done with the cardiac um, side of things. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I've got a couple of uh, other announcements to make, so please don't run away just yet. But we'll let you go back. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you.